Amendment 2 was an amendment that um, legalized discrimination against gays. And if you voted no, you were opposed to discrimination against gays. If you voted yes, you were legalizing discrimination against gays. It basically prohibits the state or any cities from passing any laws, any laws that will grant special rights to homosexuals. In the week or two after the election, suddenly the media, television, what have you, is going to the legal community and saying, well, what does this really mean? You know, we've had complaints that Amendment 2 doesn't really mean that it's legal to discriminate against gays. And the legal profession is saying, oh, yes, it does. That's exactly what it means. And uh, they're saying, well, gays, gay civil rights are protected as everyone else's are. And the legal profession says, no, they are not. There's no recourse for discrimination for being gay. All the same rights and protections that you and I enjoy, homosexuals enjoy those same civil rights protections. But what they are seeking is they are seeking additional rights that have historically been given only to legitimate minorities, such as blacks, Hispanics, and, and so forth. Yes, in the sense that gays have the right to the freedom of religion, gays have a right to freedom of the press, that sort of thing. It is true. But gays are defined exactly by, by who they are and what they do. And there's no guarantees uh, of protection for being gay. So that for, by being a gay person or a lesbian, you could be thrown out of an apartment. You could lose a job. You could be denied a job. You could be denied service in a hotel. You could be denied service in a restaurant. Whatever you want to think about, whatever kinds of freedoms we think about, all those could be denied to gay people with the passage of Amendment 2. That is something that uh, is uh, um, gay-generated propaganda and hysteria saying that it legalizes discrimination. In the state of Colorado, we've never had a problem with discrimination before Amendment 2. And as I said before, um, the same laws apply before and after Amendment 2. It's just that they want to be able to pass some additional laws, giving them some additional powers. And so that's why they're screaming so loudly. People hate gay people. This is something that exists in society. And um, gay people being stigmatized all their lives were an easy group to pick on. And, uh, it was certainly, uh, I was surprised too that in a country where we uh, support freedom and support equality, that, especially in a place like Colorado, which is known for its uh, live and let live attitudes, that we would come forward and, and say that everyone is equal except for gays and lesbians. Uh, I don't hate gays. Um, I don't approve, I don't like what they do. I don't like their lifestyle. But as people, I do not hate them, um, and I uh, treat them with dignity and respect, which every human being is entitled to uh, because God created us. The messages I got from people were, you're no good, we don't like you, you're not part of us, you're not part. Uh, I, I've been a person who's been very involved in volunteer work, uh, worked for the museum, have uh, worked in historic preservation and I felt like even with all the contributions that I've made to society and I've led an honest life and I've been a decent person that even with all of that I wasn't equal to anyone else I wasn't part of it I was a stigmatized person uh, a person who uh, who was being told by society that you're not good enough to join us that you're not part of us the homosexual lifestyle has absolutely nothing positive about it, um, only negative things. Now, I'm not saying that an individual gay person can't bring great contributions to society, uh, such as being great scientists or doctors, so forth, but the lifestyle itself um, has given us AIDS. It's brought that scourge to the United States, uh, uh, you know, 75 percent of um, of the AIDS cases are among homosexuals, um, and uh, there's a very high 
rate of suicide among homosexuals. It's a miserable lifestyle. It's the assumption on the part of the Christian community, and they're the ones that lead this, that being gay is a choice. I don't know any gay person who thinks it's a choice. I think people have the right to choose who they associate with. I think they, they have the right uh, to choose who they live with, um, and they have the right to express their beliefs. And that right is uh, fast being taken away by, um, by uh, politically correct thinking. It's morally wrong to take a class of people and make them hate themselves and make them struggle all their lives. feeling that there was some other type of, of power in the room. Coming through him or how it worked, I'm not really sure. It made me very uncomfortable. I've never been in a situation like that. It's certainly something, when I left, I was ready to leave. And I wanted to get as far away from that place as possible. And it's not a place I will ever want to go back to. Palmistry is a study of the hands as a reflection of, um, I guess one way to say this would be the electrical impulses of the mind, of consciousness. I went to a palm reader and it was quite a bit different than I expected. When I first set up the appointment, I thought that it would be um, very interesting, very intriguing, and I didn't have a lot of belief. In palm reading, I didn't really think that there's a lot he could tell me about my past or my future by looking at my hands. Your emotions are very powerful guidelines for you in this lifetime. Your worst fault is that you're too sensitive, too sensitive, and you haven't figured out how to cope with that yet. Okay, you still have difficulties with abrasiveness, which is why you keep your vulnerability as deep as you do inside of yourself. But it'll come back out again. Your fate line is very strong. I think you're going to get a lot more playful when you get older. I tend to suspect that you got swept into the old responsibility routine when you were a kid. And I think you fell into that very naturally. So you didn't play as much as you could have. You'll do that later. You'll be one of those old ladies with a motorcycle. <laughs> Having a good old time. Your spiritual nature is very highly developed but it is not necessarily focused, okay? So you have a good sense of spiritual ethics. The, the markings that are moving up to the Jupiter Mount are brilliant. And more likely than not, you've done work on your spiritual nature in other lifetimes. Um, but when I say not focused, what I mean is that um, you probably don't have the clarity of mind at this point in your life as to what all of that means. It's more a feeling than anything, that you, you feel connected and your ethics are good in that sense. You have a real good attitude toward life. Um, but one of the things that needs to be worked on a little bit is looking at the bigger picture. Okay, And more likely than not, this will happen in your mid-30s, mid to late 30s. Okay, And more likely than not, you're going to lean in more of an eclectic direction, meaning that you'll try and take the best from all places and not just focusing on one particular line. He did use a few specifics that made me very uncomfortable because I had never met this person before. And how was he supposed to know all these things about me? He didn't ask me questions. I did not respond to any of the things that he said. I didn't um, nod or give him any kind of affirmation as far as what he was telling me. I just listened to him. There's a pretty strong line here, a pretty strong affection line, which is actually earlier than where you are right now, but it runs through where you are now. Um, that's a pretty strong relationship for you. There's another person indicated sometime in your mid-30s that you'll have affection for, 
there's a very powerful relationship in your early 40s, okay, which is also going to be somebody that will be very strong influence in your life. These are not all necessarily marriages, by the way, and stuff like that. These are people that you care about, people that you work with. And then there's a couple as you get later into life, and they're probably going to be real good friendships of yours. But there's going to be three people from the age of 45 that are going to have a very powerful influence on you, very strong influence on you. As far as I'm concerned, there are already very significant people in my life. As far as if there's going to be someone coming in when I'm in my mid-30s or my 40s or whenever, who knows? As far as I'm concerned, God knows about our future. But we take a lot of, of that direction from God in situations that happen. How does he know about that? I don't know. And does he really know? I don't know. We'll have to live my life and see. But I doubt it's certainly not something that I'm going to hold on to and say, OK, I'm in my mid-30s. The palm reader said I should have a significant person, so I'm going to start looking for that person. As far as I'm concerned, it was evil, and it did give me a very evil feeling. And something that was very uncomfortable that I would not want to go back to, it was hard to describe, but it, it gave me butterflies. I felt sick to my stomach. He was touching parts of my past that I didn't like him knowing. I did not like him knowing who I was. And being a private person, it's not fun when somebody gets that close to you that you don't really know or have any kind of special feelings for. I was excited and a little bit scared to go because I didn't know what they were going to do to me. But I was excited because I've seen other people do it before and they've been like really happy with the results. I was being like totally pampered. <laughs> they did my hair. And they did my makeup. Okay. Oh, that's so pretty. Okay, bring your chin over here just a little bit more. Now bring your chin down just a little bit. Okay, right there. One, two, three. You know, everybody wants to make some kind of an impact in their life. This is an impact that I really feel proud of doing. I'm, I'm really raising ladies' self-esteem. I'm making romance a lot in the household for the husband. All of a sudden, here's his woman, the way he's always, you know, in the magazines. He's seen her, okay? This has a whole new magic in the relationship. It shows you, like, the best that you can look and that um, you can always look good no matter what you think you look like. You know, you just don't think of your kid <laughs> who's running around all the time sweating and playing soccer in, in this kind of fashion. I mean, I can hardly get her to wear a skirt to church. She's really into jeans and t-shirts and all that. So this whole thing was a new look <laughs> for her. But it was not, I mean, I just thought they were really nice looking when I saw them. And I have to say, I certainly wouldn't mind showing them off to anyone and saying, hey, this is my little kid. Do you believe this? <laughs> She's growing up. It would be good to do if like you're feeling kind of down and feeling like you're not important or that you're not pretty but it's not looks that count in the real world so 
I find the younger the girl gets this done, and because I've had customers tell me this, even young girls, even little girls, five, six, seven, they get this done and they see themselves as they get more confidence in themselves because looks is never a factor after that because they know that they are up there and they can compete with anybody. It's never a factor for them anymore because they know they're pretty. Do you know what I mean? They know they can do it if they want to. They don't need to do it all the time, but they can do it anytime they want and they have a new confidence in themselves. Everyone is beautiful. Everyone's pretty. You just got to bring it out. The Nina Street Center programs offer services to youth in need, homeless youth, wards of the state. We will provide service to any kid who comes in our door, no matter what it is. Residential services, a place to take a shower, a place to talk to somebody, educational services, substance abuse services, vocational training, someone to talk to. One of the things that, that I am most proud about the every single kid who has come through here is that they have made that decision that the streets can be bad but it can be no worse than the situation that I'm living in. Well, my father died when I was nine. Up until I was nine, I was doing okay. My father died and my mother started changing. You know, she started hollering at me and my brother, my older brother mostly, and then I just started like one day, I didn't want to come home because I didn't want to go home to all that arguing and bickering. So I just stayed out. And then, you know, I got tired of, she got tired of me running away and stuff. So she took me to a police station and they, they put me in this psychiatric ward in St. Mary's Hospital, St. Mary's of Nazareth Hospital. And um, they asked me, did I want to go back home? And I said, no. And my mother said that she didn't want me back home. My situation, I became homeless. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it was by force, it was also by choice as well, because I chose to leave on top of, you know, having my you know, mother yell at me and whatnot. I mean, she would yell at me all the time, and she would be like, well, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta learn to be, a, be grown, you gotta learn. I'm like, well, I don't know how to do that. You gotta teach me those types of things, you know? I mean, that's the impression I'm getting. That's what being a parent is all about. There was a lot of situation going on. Too many. Just a lot of, you know, stealing, drugs, you know, and assault and battery. Well, I came here to stay with some fr friends, and I got robbed at the airport. My whole while I got robbed. So I had no place to go. So that was the first time I experiencing being homeless. Well, my mother died when I was two years old. And from there on, my grandmother, you know, took custody of me and she raised me from two to, to the age of 18. Once I got 18, you know, I figured, you know, I was grown. So I just basically started really doing whatever I wanted to do. So, you know, one thing led to another. You know, I started really drinking at home and stuff, you know, smoking a lot of marijuana in the house and stuff like that. So she just left, you know, and... You know, she gave me some money before she left, and, you know, she left me with her blessings, you know, and prayed for me and everything, and she left, and from then on, you know, I was on my own. If you're living, you know, with a family, every day, you know, you expect, you know, something warm, you know, you have some food. Without that, it's hard to believe, you know, you're like, no, that's never going to happen to me. But, you know, eventually it did. Were you scared? I was scared because I didn't know where to go. I had no idea what I was going to do, what my life was going to be. Before I started going to shelters, I would be in a vacant apartment. I would be sleeping at a friend's house or in a friend's car, and I would wake up early in the morning, you know, try to hustle some money and get something to eat, you know, just hang out all day or, you know, just, you know, basically what the main thing was trying to get something to eat, you know, and trying to find some place to really rest because, you know, most of the time it was spent was up and about walking around and whatnot. 
some of the things I did, we would find a place to play cards and we would gamble or we would shoot craps or, you know, just plain out, ask for money, you know, or stand on the corner, excuse me, can I buy a little change? I want to get some need, you know, whatnot. And, you know, a lot of things that, you know, is, you know, you get discouraged when you're in a, that type of a situation because a lot of people look down on you. When you go to certain shelters, you know, you, you realize, well, I've seen him somewhere before, you know, and that could be the same person you've seen picking in a garbage can, you know, you're sleeping right next to him on a mat or something like that, you know, and it, that lowers your self-esteem a lot, you know, it makes you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm worth nothing because I'm laying here with people that I've seen picking in garbage cans, you know, when I was riding past in a car or something, you know. I know there's a God. Tell me how you know. Because I wake up every morning, I'm blessed with life, I'm blessed with a roof, over my head, food, clothing. Why me, you know? What am I doing in this situation? I mean, why did you pick me? I mean, I had a normal life, and then all of a sudden things turned from normal, and just made a 360 and turned around the other way around and got worse, and I'm like, well, why me, you know? It's like throwing your hands in the air and stuff like that, and like, you feel like giving up, why me, you know? I do know that there has to be a reason for what I'm going through. I mean, further down in life, you know, there has to be some type of outcome as far as it's a repercussion it has to be some type of uh, positive experience in the long run. I mean, because you have to suffer something negative to learn how to deal with things in a positive way. And I guess this is my way of suffering, I guess. We are our brother's keepers and people have to remember that. Y'all ready? Yeah! yeah. Are y'all ready? Yeah! yeah. All right. When I say neon, you say street. Neon. Street. Neon. Street. When I say neon, you say street. Neon. Street. Neon. Street. Neon. Neon. Street. Street. Neon. 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 Street. 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 One, two, three, four. The N, the E, the O, the N, the F, the T, the R, the E, the E, the T. Neon. What? Street. Neon. What? Street. The N, the E, the O, the N, the F, the T, the R, the E, the E, the T. Neon. What? Street. Neon. What? Street. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>